Hello, good afternoon. My name is Nicole Nash. I am the manager of range and retail programs with the Archery Trade Association. Welcome to our next Coffee Talk, which we have a panel discussion ready for you guys today to discuss the conservation efforts that um, these conservation educators are leading and some trending things that they are starting to see to raise the participation in bow hunting and how you as a member, as a retailer, a manufacturer can get involved in many different ways to help join efforts and connect the dots together. As a part of the outreach and education team with the ATA, we are constantly trying to find ways for the industry to connect with our conservation educators and in turn connect those dots with our conservation educators to you the industry. So um, we have a couple questions we are going to ask, but if you have any questions in particular, feel free to ask them. This is just an open panel discussion. I hope you enjoy. First question is just to simply introduce yourselves and pro provide a description of the programs that you guys have going on for everybody. All right, thank you for coming. My name is Donise Peterson, and I am with a company, a nonprofit called Raised at Full Draw. Um, previously, I was with the Iowa DNR for 10 years as their archery coordinator um, with the Archery in the Schools and um, Range Development. And now with Archery Raised at Full Draw, uh, we have camps across the United States, mostly in the Midwest, that teaches bow hunter education. Um, we have youth that come from 12 to 17 years old. We also have a women's camp, and this year we're starting a families camp. Um, three of those are in Iowa, Wisconsin, Montana, North Dakota. We had one in Kansas and Illinois. We're looking at Missouri and Michigan. So we're continuing to grow, um, but we have limited based off of our trailer um, and volunteers. So I'll let Jamie go. Thank you, Don East. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, my name is Jamie Cook. I serve as the state coordinator for Pheasants Forever and Quell Forever in Iowa. Um, you may be asking why does Upland Game care anything about uh, archery and, and bow hunting in particular? And uh, it just goes back to kind of stress the organization's commitment to R3 and hunter recruitment. Um, my position wouldn't be available if it wasn't for a partnership with the Iowa DNR um, in their shooting sports program. And so um, I report to there are three coordinator there in Iowa to work on mentoring uh, programs uh, and uh, learn to hunt opportunities and programs such as Field to Fork. So um, prior to that, I spent some years in Kentucky working as their R3 coordinator uh, before coming up to Iowa. So that's me, Hank. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hank Forster, um, Assistant Director of Hunting Heritage for the Quality Deer Management Association, um, S3DA board member. Um, so uh, at QDMA, we, we do a lot. Uh, you know, I oversee anything to educate or advocate for a new hunter, um, youth or adult. And we have a, a, a lot of different programs that we use for that from traditional youth programs, uh, involvement with Scholastic 3D Archery. Uh, you know, we have hunting 101 eBooks. We just launched the first ever Learn to Deer Hunt curriculum with HunterEd.com. Um, we have plenty of mentored youth hunts, uh, military veterans hunts, but probably, probably our shining star is, uh, is adapting field to fork for, for deer hunting with our branches. Um, so, um, we, we really are going after a, a diverse and new hunting audience focusing on adults, um, and really trying to raise hunting participation and societal acceptance, the goals of our three through our strategic programs. Great. Thank you, guys. So on to the second question and maybe something that is on the top of your minds. With each one of your respective programs, how do you all find ways to involve the industry, more in particular retailers? How, can, how are you involving retailers into your programs? And if, or if you're not involving retailers directly, how do you think you plan to involve retailers in the future? So Raise It Full Jaw has our camps at um, locations with 3D targets. Um, and then we also need enough space for um, archers and families to tent camp at if it's our overnight facility. 
Um, so one is the location, depending on the retailer's um, ability. And then we also have retailers that come to our camp location and help each of the archers set up their bows. So that way they're familiar after they leave the facility of where to go to um, to continue to purchase their bows and to get fit um, with that facility. It's really helpful to have those um, individuals on, on staff too, and I mean staff by volunteering, um, but so that way, if a bow breaks down during camp, the retailers are also there helping us and assisting um, to um, fix that bow if so needed. If, if not, we also have folks to help us there too. But um, retailers are very important um, for us because we need, them, we need our individuals that are coming back from camp to go to a facility that they know and that they can understand um, as well. So partnerships with that is really critical for us within our uh, retailers. Thank you, Donise. Um, with our Fill the Fork program in Iowa, we um, piloted last year with the help of Donise while she was still with uh, Iowa DNR. Um, and this year we took the program to Iowa City. Um, and just straight out of the gate, the program wouldn't have been uh, as successful as it was uh, without the help from the retailer Finn and Feather in Iowa City um, and the, uh, the help that they provided um, they got on board by providing setup initially. We, we did have some bows that needed inspection. Uh, they provided setup. Uh, they got some uh, rests and got the arrows and fill tips together for us. Um, DNR uh, worked with them to, to be invoiced for those products. So uh, they were making a little bit of money off of that, but I know that they helped us out quite a bit with it. Um, and help provide that at a cost that we could do in order to pull off the program. Um, I think the biggest, the biggest, uh, help that they were to our program and the way that they really helped our program get off the ground there in Iowa city was providing the range time. Uh, they had access to an indoor range that had uh, four, four or five shooting lanes, maybe even six shooting lanes. Yeah. 12 shooting lanes. Gotcha. It was a way off 12 shooting lanes. Um, and this provided a great opportunity for the students, the uh, young adults uh, to practice ahead of time. I think they got to come in every Tuesday night and shoot on their own with the help of uh, Kirk and some of the other staff, Colton, um, and tune their bow in. So they got to pass, the, the archery techs got to pass on their knowledge and expertise to the participants there in the store. Um, and I know that was probably one of the biggest lifts. Uh, this group got so close, not knit, that after they would practice, they would go down to the local brewery and, and get a beer together and, and hang out. So they really did a great job in providing social support, which is a, a huge, huge need, which can't really be tracked monetarily. Um, and, and finally, I think moving forward with, with retailers in Iowa, what we're hoping to do with our Field to Fork program there is uh, create an option to buy program. And so if we're going to be talking with uh, retailers there about how we can find a good price point for a new person to be able to have the bow set up for them, let them try it for eight weeks. And then once we get into hunting season, if they want to buy it, then that money can go towards replacing the bows on the backside and the new hunters are equipped and ready to go. So we're, we're exploring that option as well. So exactly. Yep. And all the bows, yep. All the bows were purchased ahead of time. So we tried to drive traffic into the store, um, especially up front, but we also saw that they were coming in to buy boots and other things throughout deer season. Um, they were doing a, a tremendous job of creating some customer loyalty there in the store. So, yep. Thank you. Um, we, we do a lot of the uh, very similar stuff to, to both of their programs, and um, I'll take it in a little different direction. And um, sorry, it's, it's a story about a gun company, but it's, it's relevant. Um, when, uh, when Charles Evans and I, the George R3 coordinator, decided to set up a booth at our farmer's market and, and pilot our version of Field to Fork, um, we, we posted our initial stuff on Facebook, and a young lady reached out, and she said, is there anything like this where I am? So I clicked on her Facebook profile. She's an engineer at Ruger Firearms, you know. She, uh, she, went, she shot for four years on the MIT small bore team, did not get a scholarship. They don't give scholarships to MIT like that. But, um, you, know, that, that had, you know, that was an aha moment. So I, so I sent her a message. She said, there are 15 employees at Ruger who'd like to learn to deer hunt, you know, if we could put something together. So we did it. We went with National Shooting Sports Foundation we had to cap it at 24 in New Hampshire because we had to host a separate hunter education class, a huge barrier to entry for people to get into hunting. And their facility could only uh, host 24 students. But 
We took 12 from Ruger and 12 from Sig Sauer, both American firearms manufacturers, and took them through a, a learn to hunt course where we paired them with local mentors. Um, we have done one for QDMA staff. When we started doing these programs, I had staff members who wanted to learn to hunt, and they said, I'd be interested in doing that too. So that's really my message to the industry. You know, we, we need your help. We, we, you know, when we're doing these adult programs, these people are consumers immediately. They have checkbooks, they have calendars, they have transportation, they'll go hunting next week. Um, but they are brand loyal consumers and whatever I tell them, they will buy. Um, as long as it's, it's a reasonable, I mean, they're not going out and buying, you know, super, super expensive equipment at first, but they will take our recommendations. But uh, we have since hosted Field to Forks for Industry. From We hosted Traeger Grill employees this year. Uh, that was the most fun I've ever had at a Field to Fork. Their professional barbecue team was our new hunters, and uh, that worked out really well. But it just shows that we need to look internally before we go externally. Teach your staff and, and recruit your staff and teach them the value of hunting. And then let's let's go out and do it for the rest of the groups. But there's so much, you know, I don't want to call it low hanging fruit, but you know, we're not even mentoring our own. And, and so, um, there's opportunity there and, and hosting these programs within industry is a very neat opportunity. But, um, you know, we, we, they, they do want your gear. Um, you know, we're, our whole goal, my whole goal is to create community based mentoring programs. You know, I want to create a community around a learn to hunt program that recruits local hunters to mentor new hunters. Um, and, and creates that social support through a local organized program. And um, you know, it creates that social support, but you could do that for an archery shop. You can run your own mentoring program. And, you know, since we started doing our field to fork in Athens, Georgia, as the pilot in 2016, we have a group of 70 people who have been involved with the program, whether they went through it and learned to hunt or they mentored for us or they're a, they're a partner or, you know, a thought leader in the state. But we have all these people who would be your clientele and your customers, and it just snowballs. It begins to grow, and it creates energy around, you know, for Athens and our pilot, it's around my office and around Athens, Georgia. But it could be your archery shop. It could be your factory uh, anything like that, but you can really involve these new hunters, uh, you know, fulfill our obligations on mission, look out for the future of hunting, but at the same time benefit. Thank you all. So obviously, as you're starting to hear how these programs are reaching out to new customers, new demographics, new potential of, um, those folks come into your shop, finding an archery home within your store. Um, switching gears a little bit, we talked about the participants and the benefits for them being introduced to a retailer. From a retailer standpoint, what's the benefit that you all see of these participants coming into the store? What benefits can retailers get out of this? So from the retailer standpoint, we believe that if participants are coming to our camp, they're going to continue to go to the retail shop. We only do camp for a certain amount of time. You do archery all year round, and we want them to know that. So if there's a facility that has a league or something specific to them, we want them to go back to that league. Uh, we want them to continue to establish relationships within those retail shops so that they are feeling strong back with that location that they're going. Um, it's really critical for us that those participants are ensuring that they're um, not just stopping. We, we try to keep connecting with them so that they know, okay, how was your hunting season? How did it go? Um, do you need help with your bow? Let's make, make sure that you are that local shop um, and that retailer that they can continue on. Yeah, right along the same lines as Donnie's mentioned. Um, you know, I think from, from our perspective, uh, you know, one of the biggest benefits is, is that opportunity to create customer loyalty, which we've already alluded to. Um, but, you know, we, we had created a, a Facebook group for this uh, cohort that had gone through this program. And, you know, they were posting pictures of them being in uh, fin and feather to pick out boots and ponchos and even, you know, probably matches and things that, you know, are, are side items to buy. So they, they were definitely uh, found the investment there, that opportunity for them to keep driving traffic back into the store. Um, although I can't speak personally for them, I would say that there was uh, quite a bit of fulfillment from some of their technicians who had the opportunity to mentor 
um, and then coach and provide that instruction to uh, adults who are, are genuinely interested. You know, you, you get your customers that come in, they just need something tweaked. They're ready to get back out. But, um, you know, the lights in the eyes of these, these new hunters, um, they were genuinely interested. They want to learn. They ask questions, I'm sure, in the shop, uh, how both perform it. And, and uh, it was a good opportunity, probably something you all hadn't experienced in the past as technicians. So um, I certainly saw that as a benefit from my perspective. Um, and then, you know, coming back to just the general um, ability to, to give back and, and benefit the Sport Fish Restoration Act and provide those funds through retail dollars and manufacturers. So, um, but I would say if, if, if I had to weigh all of them, I would say the opportunity to provide that expertise and that knowledge in the store would by far be one of the biggest benefits. So there's a tremendous investment in creating customer loyalty. I, I completely agree with everything that's been said. Um, you know, what we're finding is that there's a lot of people out there that want to learn to hunt that have had longstanding interest in hunting. And when you give them the opportunity, whether youth or adult, you know, if I owned an archery shop, I would have a Scholastic 3D Archery Club and I would run an adult program. We've got to teach the parents in order to actually get the kids a feel. You've got to go after the mentor of them. Um, but, you know, we not only are these new adults our best advocates for hunting. They're going back to their peer groups and they're telling their story. They're sharing their venison. They're, they're, they're mentoring for us. Um, you know, that's a hard thing to quantify, but they're, they're recruiting their own and they're bringing them back with them. And so it, it's a great opportunity to build a local community and continue to get into other diverse groups. Uh, hunting is perceived as dawning. It's not that hard, but from the outside point of view, it is daunting. And um, they just need our help and support in order to gain that confidence to go out there. But I, you're, you're fortunate. Uh, I, you know, archery equipment is, is very popular with these new diverse groups. Um, there's a stigma against guns in this country. And they are way more inclined to pick up a crossbow or a bow and arrow and take it afield. It might be the the, you know, they might be looking at it as like a romantic point of view to Native Americans or just that it's a more fair chase that, you know, it's giving that animal a little more opportunity, more ethical. But um, but we're we're finding that they just light up when you when you say, hey, we're going to use archery equipment. So um, I see the archery industry as being, um, you know, kind of the banner holder for this, that, that we're going to these people are going to come to you. Um, and, and they can hunt in urban areas with archery equipment. Uh, they have more access to ranges. You know, where I live, we don't have a decent rifle range within an hour drive, and the, the one that's an hour away is a public land facility with no oversight. So, um, you know, they, we're uniquely positioned in the archery industry to, to be that conduit, to be that first source for them. Um, and, and they're hungry for knowledge and experience. And that's probably the biggest thing that I can convey to the current hunting population and to you as industry. Um, you know, you can look around this show. You can look around any group of hunters. Um, you know, we're 90% we're male. We're 97% Caucasian. We are not diverse. Um, but you're, you know, you, we can be a traditional hunter base, but our knowledge and our experience is valued by this new person. And that is hugely rewarding to both sides. I often hear that the passion for hunting that our mentors possess is infectious to the new hunters. And at the same time, the new hunter is, is you know, empowering that mentor and reengaging them. And I have a lot of mentors who have taken back up hunting because of it. So I see this as a good trend continuing. One quick question to add. We're talking about this new audience. Um, really quick, what is your target audience? Or do you have a target audience? Who are you seeing the most that's coming in? Originally, our target audience would be those youth 12 to 17. But now we have a large focus on women in families and young adults um, for raised at full jaw. But we want everybody. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter your diversity. We want you. If you don't know how to bow hunt or if you don't know how to shoot archery, we want them to come. And for our particular programs in Iowa, we, we're targeting adults, you know, 18 and older, uh, primarily through our limited staff and efforts. Um, but we do have, you know, chapters and other groups that are reaching out to youth as well. 
Uh, but our programs were, were, were looking for adults who are interested in learning to shoot and interested in where their food comes from. And when those two interests lie closely together, that's generally our, our target audience. And uh, we've been able to network pretty close with some organizations that have ties to diverse audience and diverse groups um, that, that focus on being able to wildland forage and come up with their own food. So uh, it, it all come down to some connections to be able to find our perfect target audience. So, yeah. Hey, Cutie May, we obviously have programs for all ages, but I, I will say our focus and our energy is in the new adult hunters, and, and we, we know why. Um, for far too long, what we've been doing wasn't working as a, as a group, or we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about this. Um, so we have got to evolve, and, and so we've, we've put a lot more energy and focus into these uh, first-time adult hunters. We see, uh, you know, an instant reward. They're inclined to hunt. You know, Jamie was speaking on, look at the advent of farmers markets and Whole Foods and people caring about where their food comes from. Um, you know, through the successes we've had, I've been able to come in contact with a, a large amount of adults from all across the country that want to learn to hunt. They're seeing what we're doing and they're sending us emails. You know, currently four and a half percent of the American population hunts. And, and that might not even be accurate. The best I can tell is I'm five hunters in the 11 and a half million hunters that we reported in 2016 because I had hunting privileges in Kentucky and Georgia and North Carolina and Mississippi and Texas that year. So how many hunters do we really have? Um, we have got to try to stem this decline and to encourage more diverse people to hunt. And, and that's what we're really trying to do. But we're trying to be diligent and efficient with our time and energy and, and funds because we've got to do something. I think everyone in this room can attest that we're experiencing a decline in this industry. And we've been predicting it since the 80s. And all we did was talk about it. We continue to run uh, youth programs and, and, and things that really were recruiting current hunters' kids, people who grew up in a hunting culture. And so really at the end of the day, I'm looking for a new first-time hunter, an adult who has interest in hunt that is self-selecting themselves. Um, I, we're finding that the food-focused hunters are, are often our most inclined, but I truly believe there are millions of people out there sitting on the sidelines wanting to learn to hunt. I don't know if we can support 10% of them hunting, but we can do a heck of a lot better than four and a half. <laughs> Great point. Thank you. Last question, just to wrap it up and give you guys a chance to ask any questions if you would like. What are the ways a retailer or the industry can become involved in programs such as this within their own state? And just to kind of kick that off, as a member of the ATA, you have access to your member benefits of contacting the education and outreach team. Contact myself and say, hey, Nicole, we are very interested in some form of capacity getting involved in a field to fork program or a camp program, a day camp program, and we want to learn how how to get into that. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give you that contact information for the organizations within your state that are running such programs. Make that introduction and help you get involved at whichever level that you feel comfortable with or want to get started. Yeah, I think that's a great way. Um, that's how I learned a lot, about, a lot about organizations too is from Nicole and ATA and um, using actually the ATA membership guide and saying, okay, what retailers were out there that we could look at and what other nonprofits were out there um, to continue our efforts together because we can't do this alone and we all know that. Um, but even just reaching out to this, I'm no longer with the state agency, but even reaching out to the state agency and saying, hey, is there a partnership that we can have? There's explore bow hunting out there. What we simply did is we took that initial explore bow hunting curriculum, invited the Iowa DNR participants who didn't have and who didn't know about bow hunting or archery, and we show, shared that information with them. We provided them the curriculum. I think it's very something that if you wanted to do that same thing, you could. What kind of corporate offices are next to you? Is there a, a Wells Fargo? Is there another large organization that you could reach out to and say, hey, I would like to do an explore bow hunting class with you, but... Um, don't maybe necessarily call it explore bow hunting, but interest to archery um, and go to that facility. And then once they start shooting, they come to your facility. 
I think that there's a lot of ways that we can connect um, industry, retailers, and individuals that want that information. Yeah, um, you, you said it all pretty much, Donise. I think, you know, the only thing that I would have to have is that, and she alluded to it, but there is a challenge in finding some of these diverse audiences sometimes uh, because we are so very pale, stale, and male, right? As, as hunters. And, uh, so how do we, how do we reach people from different communities and backgrounds? Um, and that's look around for organizations that are already within your community, uh, that have touch points. Both of these folks have alluded to businesses and, and organizations and groups to go after. And that's a great start as well. Um, but it just takes some time to network and, and find those niches where you can have a true impact. Um, I think finally, just personally, if, if you're a hunter, uh, or an archer, um, mentor somebody. I think that's the, the biggest way everyone can get involved, um, whether you're in retail or not, uh, is, is to take up the, the challenge yourself of just mentoring a new hunter that uh, doesn't look like you or act like you or may not even vote like you. So, um, yeah, good luck. But that that's, in my opinion, the big need out there is just mass mentoring. Well, first off, let me, let me start off with saying you should be proud of your trade association. They have an amazing outreach and education team, uh, you know, talented professionals, and they're doing a lot for the industry. So the kudos to ATA. Um, you know, we will do more if we work together. And every one of us has our strengths and our weaknesses. And get involved with your state R3. Um, you know, most states have a coordinator today. They have steering committees. They have stakeholder groups. Get involved. It'll be a good opportunity for you. Um, these are at the desk over here, so I, I can hold them up. But we've worked together. Um, we've created a mentor guide um, with ATA and QDMA as well as a guide for Field to Fork. Uh, you know, we have standardized curriculums. We have, um, you know, the resources available to try to make this easier for other people to replicate. So, um Check them out. It's going to be on the resource guide on ATA's website. Uh, these are It's not to be a printed document. These are just some that they have for view, and, the, and I was able to snag a couple. But, um, but um, we, we want to help. We, you know, we all have skin in this game, and, and we want uh, you know, more hunters. And um, you know, we're fortunate. We, we've got to realize that we are recording approval rates of hunting, public approval rates of hunting higher than we've ever seen before. We've got to get out of our shell, talk to non-hunters about hunting. They like what you do. There's very few people who don't like hunting. And we have to, we have to think about that and be advocates for the sport uh, or whatever you want to call it. Sport sometimes has a negative connotation with some groups. But we need to be talking to others about hunting, mentoring, as Jamie said. Um, you know, we've created these organized programs um, and, and they're really neat. They do great things. But if we want to move the needle on hunting participation, it's going to come down to one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So we need all hunters to realize it's their duty. We need to, we need to change the culture of hunters to that you're not a real hunter unless you're bringing others into this. And, and we're not there yet. I, I guarantee you we could raise our hands right now, and less than half of us took a new hunter out last year. Um, so, so we really just got to put our money where our mouth is, uh, or, or our mileage and, and get out there and do it. Thank you all. As you can tell, these three are very passionate about the outdoors. Um, not only are they practicing what they preach themselves, but they are continuing to think of ways how to expand on that and keep that interest and engagement going. We could probably stand here for another at least an hour and a half and continue to talk about this without repeating ourselves. But um, I want to open it up. Does anybody have any questions? I know we actually have Finn and Feather Outfitter, who is the retailer that worked exclusively with Jamie during his program. If you have any questions specifically for them or any of our panelists up here. Finn and Feather shaking their head no. All right, you guys, again, the ATA Outreach and Education Team, um, we are continuing to think of ways of how to connect the industry with these conservation educators and how we can take these conservation educators and the efforts that they are making to have their boots on the ground, to reach out that new demographic, create that new customer base, to raise the rise in 
bow hunting and archery. If there is anything at all that we can do to provide to you as a resource, or if you yourself are involved in programs that is working for you, please come see us. We would love to hear your stories and we would love to hear how we can help you out and bring that new customer base into your shop. Thank you guys for coming. We appreciate it.